Few writers would have the self-confidence to reimagine the classic Don Quixote, often referred to as the first modern novel. But there are a few writers like Salman Rushdie. His newest novel, Key Shot, takes readers on an equally epic journey, exploring the dilemmas of a world that has lost its grip on the truth. And it brings Salman Rushdie back to our studio tonight. Welcome back. Hello. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, I may look calm, but inside I'm screaming and I'm jumping up and down. Okay. <laughs> it's All very right. excited to meet you. Thank you. Um, so uh, take us through this book. Uh, who is Keyshot? Well, he, he's, um, when we meet him, he's a, he's a traveling salesman in pharmaceuticals in, in Gallup, New Mexico. And he's old and lonely and watches a ridiculous amount of awful television. And as a result, he's, he's a little cracked. Mm. And, and he falls in love, as he would put it, becomes obsessed by, would be probably a more accurate thing, mm -hmm. with a woman on television who's a daytime talk show host. And you call her Oprah 2.0? Yeah, <laughs> and she's called Salma R, a name which is one letter away from my name. Was that intentional? Sort of my personal little joke. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, he decides ludicrously that he's going to win her hand, that he's going to go on this quest, which involves driving rather erratically across the United States in his old, battered old Chevy Cruze. And, and he wants to prove himself worthy of mm -hmm. her in a way that is absolutely improbable. Mm -hmm. So that's who, that's who he is when we meet him. And, uh, and one whole element of the book is that is that quest. Well, the book is um, inspired by Cervantes' Don Quixote. I want mm -hmm. to talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. But there's something that you said in your answer. It just clicked to me, mm -hmm. um, the loneliness. If It seems as if a lot of the characters, um, they have many things in common, but they also have loneliness yes. as something in common. Was that something you were experiencing? Yeah. Or is, why no, write about it, that? But what I think is that it's a thing that is happening in the modern world, mm -hmm. you know, that that strangely and paradoxically in, in this society in which we've invented so many ways of communicating with each other and so many ways of having quotes friends on quotes mm. that actually many of us are more isolated than before and are leading more separate lives you know why the, do you think that is well i think it's a it's a consequence of of this of this strange electronic world we've created you know that um that the real world is becoming more separate and I, mean, I think it, it has something to do with I mean one of the other subjects in the book which is opioid addiction I think also comes out of people's sense of isolation and loneliness so he's a lonely man he's never married he uh, doesn't have children and then he invents one for himself um, but I think if he weren't that kind of person he wouldn't be the crazy person to whom this obsession becomes a real thing you know and he so he is you know, in the way that Don Quixote, the great character of Cervantes, was was deranged by the popular culture of his time, you know, these kind of absurd romantic novels about knights in shining armor, um, my Quixot is deranged by the popular culture of his time. Which is the technology and which the... Is, which is essentially television. Um, what was it about uh, Cervantes, Don Quixote, uh, that you wanted to approach through your own writing? Well... First of all, I had wanted to write a road novel. You know, I'd really had, before I thought about Cervantes, I thought I want to write a novel which doesn't just sit in New York City as the previous novel did, but gets out across the country and sees what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. you know? And then when I thought about the Cervantes book, I thought, well, what is good about that is that these characters, Quixote and Sancho, you know, are, they're very opposite. Sancho is very earthy very grounded, very realistic. Quixote, Quixote is, has his head in the clouds. He's, he's sort of airy, he's a dreamer, you know. And I thought that, to have those two contrasting types of the dreamer and the realist mm. and send them across the country would be, would be interesting. And then the strange thing that happened was that my Quixote, in certain important ways, turned out not to be like uh, the Cervantes character, because Don Quixote is probably best thought of, known as for being melancholy, you know. He's the knight of the dolorous countenance, you know, he has a long, sad face. From the moment I started writing my character, he, 
he determinedly wanted to be cheerful. He wanted to be cheerful, with a nice smile, with excellent manners, mm -hmm. and to be an optimist. You know, he's, he's sort of relentlessly hopeful, including about his chances of winning the fair lady, you know, but about everything. Mm -hmm. um, he, and, and I thought there's something interesting about taking a character whose main characteristic is optimism, you know, mm -hmm. and sending him across the United States which may not be at its most optimistic moment. Well, know? is it a foolish optimism? Well, he is, he is a fool, mm. but I mean, he's a kind of holy fool, you know, so, so maybe optimism is always a little foolish, mm. but it's also very endearing, I think, and I think he has that quality of being, you want him to be right. You want the world to be what he thinks it is. Well, he's living in a world, or we're living in a world, which you call the age of anything can happen. Mm. So in this age of anything that can, can happen, is he being optimistic or is he being realistic? Well, what is interesting about that, that what he calls that the age of anything can happen, is that on the one hand, you can understand that negatively, you know, and that this is the age in which a reality TV star could be president of the United States, you know. Um, but, you, but he interprets it positively, because he can say, well, if anything can happen, then, you know, a foolish old coot like me mm. has a shot at winning the heart of this, this gorgeous, famous, powerful, successful woman who is the exact opposite of me. Mm. So it means that all possibilities are open, negative ones as well as hopeful ones. And Keyshot's story is uh, being told by somebody else. Yeah. Who is this somebody else? Well, this is the bit that was unexpected to me. I wasn't expecting the second storyline. I thought this, what we've been talking about, that would be the story, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and then I found myself writing this, this character who turns out to be the author of the Keyshot storyline, who is a, kind of by his own admission, second-rate spy novelist. Um, who's decided in his in, in his later years to try something completely different, and and then finds out that what he's writing, which is the Keyshot story, is in a way, for him, a way of looking at his own life and his own um, concerns and failings and and his own family. So he has a sister that he's estranged from, he has a son that he's estranged from, and a variation of both those storylines is written into the Kishot storylines. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I hope happens as the book goes on is that the reader will see that the storylines kind of, in a way, illuminate each other, that, you know, that, that what's happening in one storyline explains what's happening in the other one. It's as if mirrors, multiple mirrors are being held out. Sort of like that, mm -hmm. um, except they're not exact mirrors because the stories don't go the same way necessarily. Right, well, I am going to attempt something, to read something that oh, you wrote. All right. <laughs> right, 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 Roz, you sit right beside me. Um, so you write in Keyshot, to make sense of the life of the strange man whose latter days he was setting out to chronicle, he would have to reveal himself alongside his subject, for the tale and the teller were yoked together by race, place, generation, and circumstance. Um, Keyshot's life and dreams carry much of what Brother laments, as you've just said. How much of Brother's sadness and worries mirror your own? Well, we have a number of things in common. I mean, we're all three of us, you know, me creating him, creating him. You know, um, we're all people of the same generation. We're all people who were brought up in the same place. Born in the same place? Uh, born in Bombay and, and also in a, in a very particular neighborhood of Bombay, which, which, which once upon a time is the neighborhood in which I set, the, set a lot of Midnight's Children. Mm -hmm. um, so I just returned to it. Um, and and we've all, we're all three of us people who have left that world and made lives for ourselves in, in the West. Mm -hmm. um, and we're all facing the big questions of mortality and so on, you know, which, I mean, that's a big subject for both the brother, brother the author, and Keyshot, the created character. And maybe yourself? And I mean, no question. I mean, I'm not 100 years old yet, but I'm <laughs> 72, and at 72, you begin to think about these things. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so yes, of course, it's a way of, uh, uh, of examining my own concerns. Yeah. Uh, what are your concerns about getting older, about mortality? Well, mostly that it, once you are clear that the time ahead is shorter than the time that's already passed. The thing that's valuable about it is it gives you a very clear sense of not wanting to waste your time. You know, um, whatever time remains, you know, use it. 
You seem like a, a very private person, mm. um, and yet in your writing, it's as if you uh, drop little breadcrumbs um, to well, maybe reveal a little bit of yourself. Or well, well writing is a very exposed thing. Mm. You know, I mean, if you if you're going to write a truthful book, then then it is very defenseless. Even if it's a novel. Yeah, mm. yeah. Because I mean, I think the the purpose of of the novel at its best is the truth. You know, I mean, it might come at the truth through s some strange doors and windows, you know, but, but uh, what we want from novels is that, is that when we read them, we think, yes, life is like this. Uh, this is what, what we are as human beings, and these, these, this is the kind of thing we do to each other. You mm -hmm. know? That's what you want from a novel. You want truth. You know? And so, of course, your own experience is the most central truth you have. And when we talk about truth um, and the novel being uh, based on truth, Having written this book, uh, do you understand yourself better? Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the, no the novel is a kind of expression of the po point in my life that I've reached. You know? mm -hmm. And I think so. Uh, what I'm happy about is that the characters have their own life, that they're not just articulations of their author. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I think that would be kind of boring. Mm -hmm. um, what I like is that I see them as now, having finished the book, I see them very much as them, not me. Right. You know, um, and I like it that because I think that that leap, you know, from from personal experience into fiction, that that's the act of creation. You know, that that journey. And so, yes, they can start very close to the author, but by the time you've written the book, they are just themselves. They're individuals mm. in a way. Mm. Um, we would love for you to read something from the book. Yes. Um, and to just set it up, Keyshot, he's immersed in the art form of his time, which is television. Mm. And you write the following. Well, this is when he's trying to think of the pseudonym that he's going to use to write letters to the lady that he's going to woo, right? And he's trying to think what that should be. And, and, uh, and he's talking to himself. He says, he says, just think back to your favorite piece of music when you were a boy. Mm. I know these days you prefer the warblings you hear on American Idol or The Voice, but back in the day, you liked what your artistic father liked. You adopted his musical taste as your own. Do you remember his favorite record? Whereupon the half-dream smile produced for the flourish a vinyl LP which half-awake smile recognized at once. It was a recording of the opera Don Quixote by Jules Massenet. Mm. Now, in this, um, in this book, you reveal that you've watched a lot of reality <laughs> television, <Yeah. laughs> including one of my favorites, Real Housewives of oh, Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Bachelor, um, is, you know, we're just going back to that passage, do you th feel like our cultural tastes have declined or expanded? Well, there's always been trash. You know, I mean, that's to say, I mean, throughout the whole history of the human race, there's been trash and there's been better stuff. And actually, a lot of my life, I have not really tried to distinguish between those two. I'm just as interested in pop music as in, as in opera, you know. Um, but what I think is particular about right now is that the trash has got trashier. Uh, the gulf between trash and, and the good stuff has got wider. And that's why I thought, I thought you know, if Cervantes was alive now, mm. what would his target be, mm. you know? And, and I thought it would probably be the trashier parts of our current culture. And I do think there's a, what I, the seri I mean, the book has a lot of fun with, with, um, with, with reality television mm -hmm. and so on. But I think the serious point is that I think not just on television, but also on the internet, there's a kind of blurring between what is true and what is not true. You know, I mean, reality television is not reality. It's, it's highly manipulated and massaged reality. Mm -hmm. And it's in a way unreality. But what yeah. impact does that have on, on people us? watch on us? Because a lot of people do think that that is real. Well, that's what I'd say. If you inhabit uh, a, a media environment in which you are really unable to distinguish between truth and lies, then if that boundary becomes blurred, mm -hmm. that's quite a dangerous place for a culture to be, you know, which, which unscrupulous persons can exploit. Do you think we're there now? Yeah, I do. I think, I mean, that's, you know, the book I think is written more or less as a comedy, mm -hmm. but I think under the comedy, there's that. It is very funny, yeah. but it's also very um, heartbreaking. Yeah, it's, I think it becomes, in, certainly in the second half of it, I think it becomes quite emotional mm -hmm. because what we were talking about a little while earlier, these family relationships, the, the father-son relationships, the 
the two, two of those and the two brother-sister relationships in the book. Those, I think, are really are the emotional heart of the book, and they move closer and closer to the center of the action as the book goes on. Um, we, uh, this term, I feel uncomfortable saying because I, I am a journalist, but mm. we've, uh, uh, we are now in an, an era that people call the fake news era. Mm. How can citizens speak to one another if we can't even agree on what's factual? Well, it's a big problem, you know? I mean, I think that's... We all have a responsibility. I think artists have a responsibility of trying to re-establish an agreement about the nature of the real, you know? Because I think one of the things that the novel has always done mm. is, to, is to create that sense between the writer and the reader, that the writer says, look, this is how it is, and the reader if he or she likes the book, agrees with that. Mm. You know? And so it, it's one of the things that maybe literature can do in this very muddied water, you know, is to try and say, look, listen to this. This is how it actually is. And, and I think there's a lot of us writers wrestling with the problem you've just, you've just defined, mm. which is how do we face this moment um, and, and get people to regain their... Their sense of their sense of reality, um, and also I think trust is uh, something that might be missing right now. Even in the book, mm. um, trust is broken between different characters. Yes. Um, what role do you think that has in getting us back to a place where we can we can have these conversations about what's factual and what's fiction? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you know, it, if we're talking about about. Uh, Journalists. There was a time when there were journalists who were extremely trusted. You know, Walter Cronkite goes on television and tells you what's going on. You absolutely trust him, you know. And and um, that's declined a little bit. Mm. And I think we have to try and re-establish that seriousness, you know, and, and not. And I, the, the, there's all sorts of problems, clickbait, all these kind of things where people chase after the wrong thing. I think we have to become serious about this. And I do think actually a lot of journalists are trying very hard. Um, and, I, it, you know, it, certainly in the United States where there's a blizzard of misinformation coming out of the most powerful place in the country every day, I, I mean, I actually have a lot of respect for the way in which journalists are trying to counter that, you know, and that's all you can do. You can just hope in the end that, that people's good human instincts about what is truth and what is lies mm -hmm. will prevail. Um, when you wrote The Satanic Verses, your name became synony synonymous with free speech. Um, how hard is it to wage that battle right now? I mean, there it is. I think, you know, one of the reasons I live in the United States was because of my admiration for the First Amendment. You know, and, and I've never known it to be so much under attack as it is now, you know, when you have uh, journalists being called enemies of the people, mm -hmm. you know, and when you have a journalist in trouble in Egypt with the United States president won't help, and the Irish president has, a, an Irish government has to intervene to rescue him, you know. Mm -hmm. These are very worrying days when, when, I think I read somewhere the other day that more journalists were attacked and killed in the last year than in any previous year. You know? So I think it's a, it's a dangerous time, but Again, one of the reasons why I think writers of all kinds, whether fiction or nonfiction, you know, need to stand up for this stuff, you know, is because it's because it's the freedom without which all the other freedoms vanish. Do you ever think about what it would have been like if you had released the Satanic Verses now? No, I mean, yeah, I think it might have been more difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in, because uh, that was. In, in the novel, some, there's, a, there's a term of BG, which is before Google. Before Google. <laughs> and then after Google, <laughs> AG. After Google. Yeah. I think, you know, the same thing happening in the age of the Internet would have been more dangerous, uh, more explosive mm -hmm. than it was then. You also bring India, which you said is a shared homeland of Keyshot, brother, and yourself, mm -hmm. uh, into the novel, as well as England, uh, where brother's estranged sister now lives. Um, all three nations are currently undergoing tremendous upheaval. Mm. How much was that in your thoughts as you wrote this book? No, it was, because I, I thought that it was strange that these three countries that are the places that I've spent my life thinking about and writing about, you know, should all be going through, uh, they're not exactly the same, but, you know, comparable crises. Mm -hmm. and, and the crises, I think, in all cases have to do with the invention of a false history. You know, that, that's to say, in England now, well, it really is England, it's not Scotland and Ireland, you know, um, uh, there's the creation of a myth of a glorious past um, 
when I guess everybody wore straw boaters and went around in punts, you know, um, that predated the arrival of all these unpleasant foreigners. And if we could just get rid of the unpleasant foreigners, that golden age could return. And in the United States, you know, what the red hat tells us is that there was a golden age of America that we could get back to if only we, you know, listened to Mr. Trump. And in India, there's this similar idea about a much more ancient golden age, the, the age of, uh, of Hinduism before the Muslim in, arri arrivals, um, which becomes a pretext for attacking minorities in the country. So in all three cases, the point about the golden age is that it's always a fantasy. There was never such a time, mm -hmm. you know. But it's being used in all three places to justify terrible actions in the present. Mm -hmm. but, if there's never been such a time, then why is it that people are able to do that? Because people like fairy tales. Mm. If you sell people a fairy tale, they'll follow you. And that's something that comes up a lot in the book, that mm. we are prone to believe the untrue. Mm. Why is that? Well, because I think right now we've become very suspicious of the truth we are told is the truth. So, um, we've become very untrusting to go back to your point. And so a persuasive fictionist, which can include a politician using fiction, can persuade people, and that's, that's what's been happening. You know? And I've, I get worried when, when the President of the United States starts telling fairy tales, because that's supposed to be my job. <laughs> <laughs> you might be out of a job soon. Yeah. Um, along the way on Kishat's uh, road trip with uh, Sancho, he experiences that racism that we've been talking about. Do you think America put that ugly genie back in the bottle? Well, I think it's been, it's been um, enabled to some extent by the public attitudes of, recent, of the last three years. And I just thought, I've got these two, I mean, brown men. I mean, Kishat is an Indian American and the, and the teenage son who he conjures into being mm -hmm. actually is described as having darker skin than him. So they're both people of high pigmentation, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, there's no way in the, in the country as it is right now that those two could drive across middle America and not experience any hostility. It would be, it would be like ducking an obvious thing, uh, truth. And so I thought, well, I don't want the novel to be a kind of polemic about racism, but I also don't want it to avoid the subject. Mm. And so there are three or four moments in the book when they, when they experience some hostility, some of which is just verbal and some of which is actually physically threatening. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's the, that's the reality. Um, Keyshot is an opioid salesman. Um, like many others in North America, it's touched your family personally. Yes. In what way? Well, my, I, my, the youngest of my three sisters, um, about 12 years ago, uh, died young. She was only 45. I'm so sorry. From, from, um, from what was clear what, what, what was an opioid addiction, mm -hmm. you know, an overdose. Uh, and at that time, I didn't even know the word opioid, you know, and, and, and I had no idea of the depth of her, of her problem, mm -hmm. you know. But it then made it a matter of serious interest for me, you know, and I began, to, at that point, I mean, this was 12 years ago, I began to look into the manufacture and dissemination of these things, which clearly have a medical value. I mean, these are not things which have, which are only lethal drugs, they have a medical purpose. But the problem is that they've become very easily available for purposes which they're not intended for. And so I started digging into, you know, Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, I mean, all these things, um, and eventually found the story that I thought I could tell. Um, and, uh, and strangely, I thought it was, for a lot of the time that I was looking into this, it felt like a kind of invisible epidemic that there it was across, all across the nation and people dying every year in really quite substantial numbers mm -hmm. and yet not very widely discussed. You know? And then by some strange coincidence, just at the moment that the book comes out, the story explodes into the news with the, with the judgments against Johnson & Johnson and, and, the, and Purdue, the manufacturers of OxyContin. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of it, yes, and it's good to pursue those people, but the thing that saddened me more was, again, we were talking earlier about loneliness, with the isolation that led people to seek solace uh, in this kind of uh, uh, illusion, mm. um, you know, and then suddenly they're drug addicts, you know, and then, they, then that becomes a different story. Mm -hmm. 
and also that how relatively easy it was to persuade significant numbers of doctors to join in the illegal dissemination of these drugs. You know, for, for, for sums of money which were substantial, $30,000, $40,000, you know, but not life-changing. You know? And so it turns out that the cost of their integrity is really quite low. Mm. What does out... that say about them or about America? Well, that, you know, in a way, to me, that was a problem at least as serious as the manufacture of these drugs. Mm. You know, it, that, that there were... I mean, of course, there are many doctors who are in, immensely ethical and so on, but, but there were significant numbers of doctors who are willing to play along and prescribe these medications, as they say, off-label, which means for things they're not supposed to be prescribed for. You know, and that seemed like an important part of the story. You became a U.S. citizen in 2016, yeah. uh, right before the last election in yeah. the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, having written this book and having time to think about all these big questions, uh, do you still believe in America? Oh, you know, the, the thing about Kishot being an optimist a ludicrous optimist, is that I suspect that's my problem too. <laughs> I think what happened is that I took... I mean, I'm not by nature despairing. Mm -hmm. It's just not my character, you know? I mean, I always think there's a possibility of change and a possibility of improvement. Um, and it may have something to do with being a child of the 60s when we all thought that, mm -hmm. you know, all you need is love. Um, but I really took the character and pushed that optimism to a kind of comic, ludicrous point. Mm. But I think it comes from me. So I think he is me kind of writ large. Mm. It's been uh, such a thrill to have you here. Thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you. It's and congratulations a on a great book. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.